to only talk about aesthetics is, is actually kind of an insult to an architect because that's the result of something. It's what it finally looks like. But that result, like the lunar landing module or a helicopter, is a result of a series of processes and thinking that went into it that allow it to behave a certain sort of way. We've gone from I like or don't like this building to understanding what the building does and tracing that through to a broad um, value system or ethic of where we have to behave as a culture to fit in the world. What we're producing here is the best of this time. It is about the future. It is about what we're trying to deliver for the public, for our children to see the best of American architecture. It's about asking questions, and it's about developing literally smart buildings. Some people are going to like it and some not, but it's much less important than actually asking what the building does or doesn't do. Can rethinking a building's design actually make people work more efficiently, more creatively, more democratically? Perhaps nowhere is that rethinking more appropriate than in the federal government. The new San Francisco Federal Building, commissioned by the U.S. General Services Administration, or the GSA, is another sign that things are changing. For a period of time in the 1960s and 70s, the, the federal government was building a not very distinguished stable of, of projects uh, to house the activities of the government. Um, and what was happening is, uh, 20 years down the road, is all of these unforeseen costs in maintenance and upkeep and replacement. We've had the unfortunate economic impetus to build quickly, cheaply, and turn over big warehouse-like buildings that were built on the cheap. They lacked personality, they lacked soul. People didn't like to work there. Communities didn't welcome them. They still don't. And now uh, there's an enormous opportunity to rethink what those buildings can be. Americans are all too familiar with uninspiring, wasteful office buildings. Mid-level employees jammed into fluorescently lit cubicles spend more than half of their waking hours there. The federal government, as the country's largest employer of two million people, had an opportunity to reshape the workplace. All it would take was leadership to recognize the power of design innovation. The GSA um, is actually the government's landlord, and they um, are responsible for about 300 million square feet of primarily office space uh, throughout the United States. So they are probably the country's largest developer, manager, and entrepreneur of real estate in the country. In 1993, the Design Excellence Program was started by Edward Finer, the former chief architect of the General Service Administration. The goal was to reach out to the private sector to find top quality design talent for new GSA buildings. The San Francisco Federal Building is one of three partnerships between the GSA and cutting edge LA based architect, Tom Main. Our perception here would, would have been the last people imaginable to be thought about as doing uh, federal government work. Uh, this, the courthouse, the NOAA project. For me, it's been a really interesting kind of ride. And it's been finally immensely fulfilling because we now complete the third of our three buildings. We were used to lots of mediocre projects. So what we really wanted to do with Design Excellence was focus on the most important issue about the building. Who would be the architect that would be responsible for the creativity, the innovation, the image, um, the functionality, everything that is important about a building. The things that last forever, it's very important that one of the messages must be that buildings must continue to represent the highest ideals of what we believe in as a society and a civilization. And I think in the last 10 years, we've been successful in bringing in new talent. We've been successful in showing what Americans, in terms of design and innovation, can show in our buildings. It has taken a backwater, which is what GSA was 30 years ago, in the architectural field. And it has propelled that whole dialogue 
into a very spirited discussion as to what architecture is about or should be about and what is the future of architecture in this country. Tom Main, the 2005 Pritzker Prize winning counterculturist, iconoclastic architect, founded the design firm Morphosis in the early 1970s. His buildings are known for reflecting not only their times, but also the conflicts, contradictions, and aspirations that define them. We don't produce things that you've seen before. We produce things you've never seen before, and that's, that's all we do. We produce prototypes, essentially, because all we're interested in is producing um, buildings that respond to a particular situation, a particular program, a particular site, a set of programmatic circumstances now, in this time of history. In the U.S. alone, Maine's work spans from California to Maryland, from high schools to courthouses. Each unique project reflects a bold, unorthodox approach with one unifying element, an uncompromising desire to marry form with function. He's always set himself apart as, a, as the, not the bad boy, but the, uh, the artist, let's say, who was somewhat apart from the establishment. But doing a federal office building in a federal courthouse and the National Oceanographic Headquarters in Maryland, you're not dealing with the outer fringes here. You're dealing with mainstream major work. So here's an individual who's extremely serious. And so he's got ideas about politics and philosophy, but he's an architect. So he works those out in the physical world. I think the interesting thing about Tom is that the way he talks about his buildings is that they represent freedom and openness and um, a kind of optimistic spirit about what architecture can do. And I think most people, including me, see them as much more aggressive and um, they have a kind of brooding quality often. So yeah, I mean, it would take a psychologist to sort of untangle all the contradictions in the work, but that's what makes it really fascinating. Even though I've been probably m more critical of his work um, than most critics, I also think he's one of the most fascinating architects because of all of those contradictions. I think all architects are the same in some way. I think when I was a kid, I looked out the window and I just said, that sucks. I probably said it in those exact words, actually. Uh, I can do that better or I want to change something. Um, I also grew up in the 60s. It had to have an effect on me. The world was changing, hugely. Of course, there was an explosion in culture at every level. Clearly, I'm a product of that. We need architecture which is thoughtful and responsive to the nature of the specifics of the place, both in humanistic and urban terms as well as in climatological terms. So you take this building that's very, very generic and you start with another set of questions. And the first questions are um, challenging its genericness. Are these buildings, um, why are they generic? And is that a necessity and does it really um, is that useful for the nature of the culture of a workplace? And as we started asking questions, it just became really interesting because you're going, well, actually, the workplace is a problem we haven't really looked at. And why don't we just kind of really focus on kind of what it means as you spend your eight, nine, ten hours a day in this place, right? I think if we were really successful, it wouldn't even be about the building. It'd be as if we were successful in replacing the model with a new model. And that'd be a much, much more ambitious goal than just making a building. So we're standing on the 13th floor of the San Francisco Federal Building. This is um, a 600,000 square foot office building um, that sits right at the corner of 7th and Mission. And we are in the tower portion of the building. The project is definitely specific to the temperate climate in San Francisco. As designers, one of the first questions we began to ask is, what are the, the specific environmental conditions on this site? What are the orientations with regard to sun? Where are the major uh, solar gains going to be happening on the project? And what are the wind conditions? We know that San Francisco as a peninsula has really good prevailing winds. So we started at the very beginning to canvas 50 years worth of weather data in order to optimize some of the basic design moves and tie them to this site. In the case of this particular project, 
we were very interested in the idea of workplace quality, which is to say, you know, how do people actually engage in an experiential way their environment as they're working? Um, there's, this is like doing a small city in a way. There's 2,000 people coming to work in the building every single day. And where we began as designers was to take a really hard look at what the experience would be of the individual who's coming to sit at a workstation and spend maybe the next 25 years of their life working for a particular federal agency. The building's siding and orientation maximize the amount of sunlight that can filter in, and the structure's unusually narrow footprint helps that sunlight penetrate deep into the building. There is a series of very inexpensive sensors that are going to be monitoring the daylight entering the space. And when the lights are not required, they will be dimmed down to zero. The estimates for lighting in office buildings, they range between 30 and 40 percent of the total energy use. So if we can absolutely obviate the need for them and also get rid of the heat gains that the lights might be putting into the space, we've gone a long, long way towards a sensible solution for the building. Anyone who's worked inside a modern office has been subjected to the overchilled air of summer and the dry, stuffy heat of winter, both major uses of energy. The San Francisco Federal Building's sophisticated technology allows for something unprecedented, natural ventilation. It also gives those who work there something else unprecedented, control. Um, there's a great psychological benefit to having control over your environment. We've known this for a long time but it's a very difficult thing to achieve in big office buildings. Local building codes all around the United States typically prohibit the use of operable windows in commercial office buildings. And what we were able to do was show the GSA's fire protection engineer that we were meeting a higher or equivalent level of life safety in the building, even though all the windows open. And so we're on a model which is closer to a European model. One of the first things we asked our mechanical engineer could we think about taking the air conditioning out? Is it even possible? Just, you just ask the dumbest question. They go, oh, actually, um, it, it actually could be, it's plausible. The building relies on the diurnal shift between daytime and nighttime temperature. So in a nutshell, uh, during the warm weather in San Francisco, the building automation system um, in the evening will open those vent windows. There are small motors that are attached to them um, and allow cool night air to enter the building, which is maybe 20 to 25 degrees cooler than the daytime temperature, and bathe all of these concrete ceilings in cool air. Um, there are sensors which are buried inside this concrete ceiling, and at which time we've absorbed enough cooling energy into the structure, the windows will close and seal that cooling energy in. So people come to work the next day and the conceptual basis of the building is that we will have stored enough cooling energy in the structure itself to offset the heat gains of the following day. So as people come to work and the sun comes up and starts shining in the building, they turn their computers on, they start making coffee and turning microwaves on to warm up their uh, Danish or something, you start to accumulate a lot of heat gain during the day. Well, the following evening, the building will open and all of those gains will be flushed out again. We call it a night flush. Now, something that is very, very important in the whole concept design as well is the fact that we have a perforated stainless steel scrim on the south side of the building, which is shading the glass and repelling about 50% of the solar gain. And on the north side, we have a series of glass sunshades that are fixed against low sun angles in the summertime. So we've done two specific solutions on the exterior of the building to help modulate the heat gains, because that's the biggest issue in um, doing low energy cooling. Maine's team used design not only to save energy, but also to reshape the culture of the workplace and promote interaction and connection between people. We reversed the order of management and staff. We put the management on the inside and the staff on the outside. They don't get the corner view, the little offices that are in the edges where they can hide away and look out the window. Uh, they're on the inside where they connect and have interconnection. One of the more unique innovations of the San Francisco Federal Building is its skip-stop express elevators, which stop every third floor and encourage workers to walk either up or down a flight of stairs. When we talked about a healthy environment, what constitutes a healthy work environment? Um, we talked about walking. There's one third the amount of stops, you get efficiency, and um, uh, you produce these second 
kind of order of, of lobbies. As part of a social model, an interactive model, and we're getting interesting responses back that they like it, that it promotes interconnection. I think this is a building that's going to have to be learned, and I think it will be learned very quickly by the people who work within it. It's not meant to uh, calm us as much as it is to instruct us. It's something, I think, to make us wake up because there are so many ideas employed in this building that we've not really seen typically employed, certainly in federal construction or even in the average office building. This is a neighborhood that I've worked in and grown up in. It's been kind of neglected by the city. So a big issue when we do build in the city is to look at a place where people have neglected. If we invest the dollars in that area, then we see that as the genesis of other people investing in that area. Maine and his team sought to integrate the new building into its neighborhood by using the building's amenities to create links between the people who work there and the community. We took the cafe, which is usually inside these, and put it on the street. So they come out of the building, they join the world, they sit in the plaza, they interact with the rest of the community, and then and we use that actually to activate the community. My vision was to actually bring into this neighborhood a place that had open space that people could feel safe in, was to bring facilities for the neighborhood that they could use, like, say, our conference center after hours for, you know, community groups to have plays, to bring the child care center that is open to the public so that we're not just an isolated federal complex in the middle of a neighborhood. We become a part of the fabric of the neighborhood. I think not only does it have an opportunity being a model for other government buildings of this type, or other types even, as far as that goes, it actually has an opportunity of rethinking office buildings in general for the private sector. But we have to wait a while to see if that's true or not. I give you the Pritzker Award winning Tom Maine. Somebody put little metal pieces on all the benches, and I think it doesn't allow kids to skateboard. And I'm going to say, no, we want children. We want young people in the city. We want skateboarders. They activate the city. It's fantastic. Timothy Leary once said, think for yourself and question authority. For Tom Maine and his buildings, it is about questioning what the status quo is, even in the way we think about sustainability. Sustainability, um, finally, it, it has to start with a, um, an intelligence of how we use energy. Simple as that. And um, in today's world, it's not rocket science. To the embarrassment of our culture, the U.S. uses just about twice the amount of energy of the average Euro European. They see us as, as um, gluttons, and they should. And we have to solve this, and it seems to be an issue that people are extremely interested in today, and it became an absolute priority in this building. When I think about sustainability, I think about it in a larger view. It isn't about just energy savings. It isn't just about, like, how many BTUs per square foot we're saving. Sustainability is about how is this building sustainable in the neighborhood? How in 100 years is it still sustainable in the neighborhood? I think people's perception of this building will shift radically as they get to know it. Uh, it's going to become an iconic structure within the city and I think perhaps uh, within the country. In the States, we've not had a major office building that attempts this level of fully integrated energy savings and sustainability throughout the entire fabric of the building. I do think it represents a really, a really significant step forward in integrating some of these ideas about um, social interaction, also about sustainability inside the building. It's not perfect as a green building. There are lots of inefficiencies about it still. I mean, there's a lot of steel in that building that's used in a, in a pretty ornamental way to do these kinds of folded planes that have always been an important motif in his work, but they don't serve any purpose. So I think it's tough for some people who are interested in green design to look at that building and really see it as, you know, as a model of sustainability or efficiency. In the end, you know, the 
sustainability of a building has a lot more to do with the, um, the feelings of the people who use it, I think, than we sometimes realize. Because if a building becomes sort of beloved and it's a great place to work, whether or not it's efficient, you know, in terms of its uh, mechanical systems, then it's going to be more likely to last. It's going to be more likely to be preserved and not knocked down to, you know, make way for another building, which uses entirely new materials. And um, so I think that's one way we have to think about sustainability, too. It's not always an aesthetic issue. Sometimes it's a philosophical issue that makes a building very unique to its community and its environment. People would write and they call and they say, it doesn't look like a San Francisco building. And, you know, that's a real tough one. Sometimes it's hard to say what does look like any city's building. Truthfully, just the overall effect, it feels pretty unfinished. I mean, I want to like it, because I, I understand, like, it represents, like, really modern technology and, you know, the next step in buildings and things like that. But I haven't fallen in love with it by any means. I think that it's wonderful that the use of natural light. I really despise fluorescent light, and, and uh, that it's, it's just a super step in the right direction regarding architecture and, and the environment. It's very clear. It's not particularly inviting. Yeah, it's you not know, inviting inside. And you can't see into any of the windows, so there's no photography from anywhere right. around. It's like we're watching you. That's the feeling. Yeah, and yeah. you can't see us. And you can't see us. You know, so it's great that it's green, but I think it's over. You know, it's in this neighborhood, and it's like, yeah, we're watching you now. Yeah, we're, we're here. I really don't care if somebody likes or doesn't like my building. We, we don't talk about, like, beauty or looks or... It's not a discussion here. We talk about the quality of the thing. Again, a building can get a helicopter. They're kind of odd-looking things. And the more you look at, look at them, the more you know about them, it's very possible you'll find them more interesting than you did the first time you saw it. And instead of thinking about its uglier beauty, it's immediately contaminated by your knowledge. And now you're finding it maybe neither ugly or beauty, but just interesting. And again, I'm much more interested in that. I would be very disappointed if it was neutral and I got no response. <laughs> Let's push the envelope a little so people are, are out of their comfort level, but it's not for anything negative. It's about creating spaces that are better for them. And once they're out taking that risk and then understanding what you're doing, then they can embrace it. One thing is this, when you about architecture, you can change your environment and it changes behavior. I think the work we're producing now, the work we're going to produce in the future, it's going to affect the culture of the workplace in terms of the inhabitant. I have no question that it's part of a, um, a thinning down of this country which has to take place. We've got people that eat too much energy in this case and they have to be retrained and they have to understand that that's important and they do understand really I think right and it's important globally in terms of how we behave in a global culture and our role in that global culture at that level it makes the project the most interesting now we're moving from architecture to huge macro ideas and we're starting to understand the importance of a single building and as that building accretes to make larger things like cities and then that turns into a culture of a country or et cetera, it connects now to huge, huge issues that are global. For more information about E Squared, visit our website at pbs.org. E Squared is available on DVD. To order, call PBS Home Video at 1-800-PLAY-PBS.